The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories. Welcome to the Tim Hill Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to have a chat with Lucinda. Lucinda's got quite a story to tell us. So Lucinda, if you can tell us where and when you were born, and then if you can describe what it was like where you grew up, the schools you went to, and the education that you received. So Lucinda, you're in the room. Hello, Tim. It's good to see you. And you. So to start with, my father was in the Air Force. So this was why I was born in Des Moines, Iowa. My uncle actually was a doctor and delivered me. My father was stationed in Belleville, Illinois. And my mom did not want to go to the Air Force hospital. So I would, she traveled up to Des Moines where my p- grandparents lived and my uncle delivered me. And then two, almost two years later, my brother was born. And then my father got out of the Air Force and we hightailed it back to Portland, Oregon, where they had been married, where they met and got married. So I grew up in Portland, Oregon. And at that time, you had to pay for kindergarten. So I didn't get to go to kindergarten because my parents didn't have enough money to pay for that. And I, they built a house out in a suburb of Portland and I went to Rockwood elementary school until we moved, we moved a lot. So I have a lot of different schools Mm. that I went to. So we moved to the Washington side of the Dalles, Oregon, which is on the Columbia river. And Uh, I was, we lived there for about three years. So I went to fifth, sixth and seventh grade there in that area, uh, had to be bused to school. And when I was in seventh grade, I think it took about 45 minutes to get to school. So I got up really early in the morning and we had to bus to school. Um, and it was all country, you know, pretty much small town, really, really small towns. And then we moved to Goldendale, Washington, where um, my mother had our, my youngest sister, she had the, my next to the youngest sister right before we moved to Dallasport. So that time she wasn't working. She had been working before that when I was in elementary school. So I went one year to Goldendale to eighth grade, and then we moved again to Wilbur, Washington, which is in the central part of Washington state. And I went to two years of high school there at Wilbur. And then we moved to Spokane area, which was, we lived on five acres in the country south of Spokane. And I went to my last two years at Freeman High School. And it was a rival school of Wilbur. So the sporting events were really interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Because I was seeing all the people that I, you know, gone to school with at Wilbur. Um, So that was fun. So so what were your parents? Were they gypsies? My father was a machine. Yes, my father had dyslexia, so he didn't finish high school. So that's why he went into the Air Force, so he could learn a a trade. And he was a machinist. In the United States, sometimes, I don't know if it's like this other places, but he would get laid off. So sometimes if they didn't have enough work. So that's why my mother worked, so that we would always have, you know, income. Mm. And uh, so yeah, he just went from better job to better job to better job. That's what he was always looking for. Ah. And finally, after I graduated, he got hired on at the Bremerton shipyards for the government. And then he was going to have government retirement. Mm. So uh, this was after I graduated from high school, I'd been off working and doing some stuff. And then I came back home again for a while because I was, going to go to college in Mm. at Fort Wright College in Spokane well when he got that job dad said don't don't stay here in Spokane by yourself come with us so they sold that house and they moved to Bremerton to a brand new house and um, my mom started working for the telephone 
she had started working for the telephone company in Spokane. So she just transferred to mm. Bremerton. And that's where my sisters grew up was in Bremerton. Um, they were quite young when I went off to college. I don't even think Celeste had started well, school yet. So. so can we can we just go a little bit back? I mean, you jumped around schools quite a bit, uh, I, mm -hmm. I guess. Was it uh, was it all in the same state in, in Washington State that you were in? And, and... The first school was in the in the Portland, Oregon area. Yeah. So it was Portland, then, Oregon, then in Washington, Washington, Washington. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess the the the, the system was pretty much the same. The, the curriculum was was sort of fairly standard across the the state. So, mm -hmm. did you have any problems with, with your learning, your uh, and transferring schools like that? No, I don't really remember that. No. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I'm the oldest, so, you know, high achiever, <laughs> all that stuff applies to me. <laughs> um, but also, I, I didn't say this, but my father was really, really great at analyzing television shows and movies and stuff. And so when we were little, he'd say, he'd ask us questions about why we liked the shows or what we thought about the characters. So English was a really great subject for me I struggled mm. with math but my mom reminded me that at one of the schools we had a really bad math teacher when I was in high school everybody struggled even the really smart kids so then when I got older and I and she reminded me of that I went oh I guess I maybe I wasn't so bad at math it was just the teacher but I got I had a phobia then about it you know yeah um, you know how that happens. So, but I liked science. I liked all my subjects except for math. And yeah, I enjoyed reading. I, I'm still really interested in watching science shows and arche shows about archaeology. And yeah. when I was in college, I even went on a dig one summer. Hmm. So, yeah. so when did you actually get interested in theater was it in in, in this sort of the, the elementary school were you in the, the plays the day of plays in your schools uh, as you went through the, or or did, was you more we moved away from portland i didn't do sports that much i'm not really very coordinated <laughs> well maybe i am but i'm just not interested in them I'm not interested yeah. in sports. We don't even watch sports on television. My husband's an artist and we just don't watch, watch them. Uh, I got interested when I was in high school at the senior. They didn't really. I went to really, really small high schools. Like there were 48 mm. in my graduating class. No, right. So there was about 200 students. So, But the seniors would have a play that they would do. And the principal or the English teacher would direct it. And I, I think that also happened when I was in seventh grade. They had a school play. And I auditioned and I didn't get in, but I worked backstage and I did that for both plays. And I really enjoyed that. Well, I didn't go to college until I was 22. And my first degree was in religious studies, but I did get interested in theater there. Hmm. My second, it was the beginning of my third year. I started auditioning for plays and working in the, the theater productions and things, even though I was finishing my religious studies degree. And yeah. then well, I then, married oh, somebody. Slow down a little bit. We're, 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 <laughs> we're bracing ahead here. So oh. you didn't go. You, you didn't go to college until you was twenty two. So what did you do from eighteen to twenty two when you finished high school? The first year I worked, I did a volunteer stint with the church that I belonged to for a whole year, working in a an inner city school in Portland as a teacher's aide. So then the next year I worked, the next two years when my parents were still living in Spokane, I was living in Spokane, but I wasn't living with them. Uh, I was working in a Montessori school as a teacher's aide. A what and sort then, 
Montessori. Do you know who Maria Montessori was? It's a style No. of teaching that's that's Oh, gaining. well, you use one of these and one of those. Uh, No? no, not that. <laughs> she teaches. It's really, it's her theory is that children, really young children are like sponges and you can teach them all kinds of really interesting things that they will remember. So you can teach them higher, higher and higher and higher math. You can teach them, you know, how to write using a thing called sandpaper letters where they, it's a tactile thing where they learn to write the letters by following the sandpaper letter that's written on the card. You can teach them how to read by using pictures and then the word together, you know, and I'm talking like three-year-old children, Mm. young, really young children. Yeah. Ah. So um, it's, yeah, the, there aren't a lot of them that go past like, elementary school that I know of in the United States, but you, that gives the students a really advanced start in learning. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then, and then when my mom and dad moved to Bremerton, I just stayed with them for a year and worked. Uh, I, I babysat a child, one child. Mm. I was like his, his nanny. Yeah. Uh, although I lived, I lived with my mom and dad, but I, took care of him during the day. It was one of my mom's coworkers. And I had wanted to go to college in Spokane. So my mom and dad decided to scrape together enough money for me to go to the church college, which was really expensive, but they, they paid for the first year. Mm. And then after that, I got student loans and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So your first year was, was um, religious studies. Mm-hmm. First, uh, I, and the, my first degree. Your first I got degree. A degree. Mm-hmm. And how long did that take? Four years. Oh, four. So, so I was, you did four four years. Was that just what you were doing, or you mm, said that the second year you you got into to looking at theatre? Yeah. Well, I was doing theatre on the side while I was finishing up my religious studies degree, mm. and my husband was six years younger when I met him. He's six years younger than I am. I met him that oh, third. You have a toy boy, eh? Yes. Oh. So uh, <laughs> he, when he came, he was also in theater, and that's how I met him. And we were in choir together, and hmm. yes. Yeah, so, uh, but I kept saying, "Oh, he's too young for me. He's too young for me." But I continued to audition for plays and work backstage, and until I graduated in 1979 and I then by then we were engaged and we got married in 1980 and then I just added a second major of theater because he was Mm. still going to school he was finishing up his art degree yeah so um that's and then and then When he graduated, we moved to Portland, Oregon again. Back to Portland. Yeah, he's from the Midwest. Portland. Uh, We're pretty liberal in terms of our religious beliefs or our spiritual beliefs, and uh, he's from the Midwest. He didn't. We didn't really want to live anywhere in Missouri or. Mm. Or where the church was a little more conservative. So we knew that uh, it was more liberal in Portland. And plus I had family that lived there and my parents were in Bremerton, which was about three and a half hours away from Portland. And we could go visit on a weekend. And, mm. you know, so that's kind of what took us there. And then eventually we just we wanted a larger spiritual life. And so we left, we stopped attending church altogether and started reading books. And yeah. Hmm. Um, so what was the first job that you did when you finally left college with your degree? 
It was a soul sucking job at a travel school where they taught, trained people to work for airlines and, you know, at the ticket counter and uh, travel for travel. Be, you know, they could work in a travel agency or something like that. Um, the, it was a very toxic work environment. And so after two years, um, I had what might be termed an emotional breakdown, although it wasn't really, I mean, I was emotionally drained, but mm. I what didn't have to go into an institution or anything like that. I didn't have a psychotic break or anything, but I was just like <laughs> fed up. I was fed up with them. Um, and so I, that's when I decided to get my master's in theater. Uh -huh. I, so where did you I, go to do that? I went to Portland State University. It's one of the three state universities in Oregon. And at that time, it was sort of like the redhead headed stepchild. Now it's like the premier university in the state. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's right in the middle of Portland and there are the what are called these park blocks so there's a street that goes on one side of the park and a street that goes on the other side of the park and there's this long park in between with trees mm. and benches and flower gardens and that kind of thing and that's where Portland State is it's built around the park the th mm. the park blocks so and, what did the course involve? Oh, my goodness. Well, I had to take, of course, I had to take all that introduction to theater over again. I had to take Shakespeare class over again. Um, theater history. So you did that song then? Brush up your Shakespeare. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, I also had to take... Of course, I took acting, uh, acting classes, and they had four or five levels of acting. And I auditioned for plays, which those are classes as well. Mm -hmm. uh, auditioning for plays, or being in plays, or working backstage. I also worked in the costume shop. That was my actual like student job, working in yeah. the costume shop. Uh, did, did you get remunerated for that, or did you have sort mm -hmm, of? Um, mm -hmm paid for it and, and it knocked off your mm -hmm. your course fee yeah mm -hmm. it was a, like it's a student student work thing yeah. yeah it didn't take anything off my um my tuition except that i could use it to pay for my tuition <laughs> yeah uh they didn't do a you know yeah so what it's did that involve? I mean, were you actually being like a, a seamstress where you, you were mm -hmm. making costumes, mm -hmm. um, costume design, or the whole gambit uh, there? I did have to take technical classes, so I did learn costume design. But when I was working in the costume shop, there was a designer who was in charge of the shop. And so I was just constructing the costumes. Mm. Yeah. I wasn't designing them i took a lighting class i took a voice and diction class i took that's where i learned you know to do uh dialects although i don't remember anything about how to do that now um uh, and you do yeah, a so there was, oh my goodness no no no, no. i mean if i <laughs> if i tried <laughs> If I listened enough and I looked at, you know, how you do the vowels and so on and yeah. so forth, I might be able to do it. But, yes, it's been so long since I've even been on the stage that I don't remember how to do any of that. <laughs> I even took a couple of playwriting classes. Yeah. Because I guess that's a skill in itself, isn't it? Writing a play. Mm -hmm. It's not like just writing mm -hmm. a, a sort of a straightforward novel. With a play, you've mm -hmm. got to write different parts and and for everybody and i've read i've read a few plays i mean i read that um mm -hmm. harry potter and a cursed child and i thought mm. um and i wasn't over keen on that so i didn't actually and, and at the time and i don't know what it's like now but trying to get tickets for it was a nightmare so I, unfortunately i didn't 
Um, and all the, didn't get the reviews, and there's been quite a lot of mixed reviews about it. And, um, yeah, so I haven't been able to see that one, but we've seen an awful well, lot I, of us. Yes, I read that one, too. And it it changed scenes so often. Hmm. I, you know, I guess I'm used to reading all these classic plays where you have this these long scenes, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, so I have never seen a Broadway show. Of course, I've always lived in the West and, you know, it's, yeah. you got to fly there. You have to, you, know, you have to stay in a hotel. Plus the tickets are really expensive. So. So do you go to provincial theater? Mm-hmm. Regional yes, theaters, we, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, we, we go to provincial theater and we also go yes. up to London as well at the West End. Oh, yeah, when, I, when, right. I, when I lived up in London, um, I was really, really fortunate um, because I was um, serving at the time and uh, I'm also a, 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 a war veteran. I, I'm mm -hmm. entitled to use what they call um, tickets for troops. Um, and, and they, and they, it's a charity that get tickets for, for different events. And um, I was able to get tickets for lots of the West End shows. Um, oh, I mean, I'm that's one of my favourites was um, Half a Sixpence with Charlie Stamp. Uh, that was that's oh. absolutely brilliant. And uh, what, just last week, uh, Half a Sixpence. I mean, the oh, original okay. was Tommy Steele back in the. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. I know who he is. Yeah. Half a Sixpence is better than Half a Penny, is better than Half a Farthing. <laughs> <laughs> He's better than none. <laughs> yeah, fine. brilliant, brilliant. Um, so last week we went to see Made in Dagenham, um, the local theatre company here uh, in in Gosport laid it on, and it was that was good. We enjoyed it. How fun! Good. Yeah. Well, we have a we finally have a commute. I'm going to jump ahead, and you can pull me back and go. We'll go back, but we finally have a actual community theater here in Sierra Vista. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a like an improv group too that are here. It, but Tucson's two hours away from where my husband and I live. And so if we want to mm -hmm. go see professional theater, that's where you have to go. Yeah. yeah so okay, so let's let, let's just wind it back then. <laughs> let's let's uh, where were we? Before we started going off a, a right old tangent. Oh, there, I was talking we? about what I studied in um, in my in, master's in, program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was quite a, a grounding course then for you mm -hmm. in theatre. Yeah. And then I started working in that Portland has several theatre companies. Some of them are semi-professional. Some of them are professional and one of them was subsidized by the city it was called the musical company and i started working mostly with them they also the city of cities around the united states have community theaters or community centers and they'll offer classes for people and so the community center system in portland had drama classes for little children. So I taught yeah. those. And I also went across the river to Vancouver, Washington and taught some over there. But I also worked with the musical company. I would audition for plays, but I also worked in their costume shop. And there were some companies that I did like lighting or sound. I didn't design it. I just ran the, you know, lighting or sound for the show. So for several years, I did that. Yeah. And then. And was that reasonable pay at the time? Were you able to sort of make a living no, out of it? No, <laughs> you couldn't really. But my husband was working and, you know, it supplemented our income. And, hmm. uh, you yeah, know, it wasn't, it wasn't really very good pay. Uh, but it was something that I loved. And. But eventually I had to make a decision because 
I was rehearsing in the evening and Barry would come home from work and we'd have maybe 45 minutes to an hour to eat. And then I'd have to go off to rehearsal and I'd get home at 1130 or midnight and he'd be asleep. And then he'd kiss me in the morning when he went off to work. <laughs> and I said, and I missed a lot of like family weddings and, mm. you know, things like that. Family gatherings. So uh, I said, you know, I, I'm never going to be a professional. I don't want to travel around the country like my friend that I mentioned before we started recording. Yeah. Uh, had to travel around the country. They call them gypsies because that's what they, you know, they go mm. from show to show to show. And I didn't want to do that. So I tearfully quit working in the theater. And then a few years later, we moved to Arizona and I got to teach. I got to start teaching it. It was a process. I didn't start mm. teaching drama right away. Um, Sierra Vista is not a really super large, it's got about close to 50,000 people in the city, but there it's the area around has a lot more people than that. So mm. uh, um, uh, the high school is quite large. It's about 2,000 students students or 2,500 students. So I started substituting mainly at the high school because most substitutes didn't want to go substitute at the high school. And <laughs> I wonder why. I know. Mm. Well, I love teenagers. Uh, I can take them in small doses. So if I see yeah, them I for think, six hours think, a day. <laughs> I think okay. with teenagers, you have to, you, you have to have the, the mindset of no fear and, uh, you're in charge. Right. You go right. in there yes. with ruling with an iron fist to start with. Lay down your cards <laughs> on the table, and 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 this is how it's going to be. And if it ain't, you can get out. And um, and I think as long as as long as you're strong and they understand that, you get on great with them. It's it's, yes. it's when when you sort of a bit lax with them and and and, and they start taking liberties. And once they think they can get away with a few liberties, then that's all they'll do. I think that's right. the trouble with kids. They'll, they'll yes, see weakness they, and they'll, they'll exploit it. Yeah, they do need the structure. They need to feel yeah. like they need, they're like little, little kids in a way. They need to feel safe. Mm. So, but I got along with them really well. And I was, they would say, Oh, you're the cool sub. <laughs> <laughs> when I'd pass kids in the hall, they'd say, Oh, you're the cool sub. And I'm like, I don't remember you, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So then it just sort of my journey to getting my master's in education sort of evolved. I got a couple of long-term sub assignments in the special ed department. Why mm -hmm. they decided to have me do that. So I was writing IEPs, which are, you know, educational plans for mm -hmm. students. And um, yeah, I did that for a couple of years. And then the drama teacher found out that I had a master's in theater. And she said, I'm getting ready to retire, apply for my job. And so I did and I got it. And so I was teaching on an emergency certification while I was getting my master's of education at the same time and directing plays and uh, I was very, very, very busy hmm. during that time. So, so did that impact an awful lot on your home life? Or, 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 or was it just sort of you were really busy during the daytime and, and, and sort of the, the bit either side doing your, your EPs and stuff like that? Oh, it did impact when I was going to school and teaching um, drama because I would have to be at, well, we had rehearsals until about six o'clock at night or something. And then I would get to go home or I, sometimes I would have to leave rehearsal early to go to my class, my night class. Uh, I only had night classes a couple of nights of a week, mm. uh, but I was doing homework. I was, you know, grading. I was, yeah. I was making costumes. I was, you 
<laughs> so for 18 months or two years, about two years, uh, I was just, I couldn't really, I'm an introvert. I need time, downtime, and I didn't have any those two years. So that was really awful. But eventually mm. when I got my master's, uh, that was really great. But then the, the, I didn't get to stay at that school teaching drama. I had to go to another school because somebody wanted my job and they, they made gotcha. sure they right. got it. Hmm. Yeah. So that's okay. I went to another school, uh, which is about an hour away from our house. And it's in the Southeastern corner of Arizona on the border of Mexico and it was a wonderful school district to teach at. I loved it. Uh, but I was teaching English most of the time. Mm. I did get to teach some drama and I did get to be the sponsor of the drama club. And we did do plays. So I got to direct plays and that was that was fun. But teaching English was really interesting. I don't have a degree in English. I have mm. lots of literature credits which allowed me to be a highly qualified English teacher, but, uh, you know, uh, so that was, I taught there for five years and then I decided I want to be a writer and I quit hmm. and started teaching at the college. All right. So that's a different ball game altogether, I guess, from, from mm -hmm. high school. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a different type of mindset going to college than, than it is in high school, different um, right. curriculum, different way of doing it. It's, it's more mm -hmm. you're, you're presenting stuff in front of a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, students and they do all the work. Whereas I guess in high school, you're doing most of the work. Well, uh, ac acting is, it, acting class is basically the same whether it was high school or in or at the college level um, because I believe that you can only learn to act by acting by doing it so I would you know assign scenes for them to do and we assign monologues for them to do and we have them to improvisation and all of that then we also have a theater, what we call theater workshop class, which is a performance class. So the students can audition for a play and get credit for it, be in mm. the play, or they can work backstage in the play. And unfortunately at the, the campus, there are several different campuses. Cochise College has, we're such a large county that they have different campuses around mm. the County. So Sierra Vista does not have a theater. The original Douglas campus has a little theater, but Sierra Vista doesn't. But Dave and I discovered that the there's this big pass through at the library from one side of the campus, the west side of the campus to the main part of the campus. And uh, so we use the library commons, it's called. We use the library commons for our performances because it has great acoustics. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do thrust theater um, staging. And um, yeah, so when I did measure for measure and my co-teacher Dave helped me with that, it was in April and it's warm enough that we could have it outside. So there's this nice, really large area just outside the library between the library and the student union building. And that's where we did our performance was on the near the library steps and the actors would come and go from the library commons down the steps mm. to enter, or they would go down the ramp and around and come through the audience to enter. Mm. So th that was really successful. So the library is sort of our, our go-to place for any performances. And now that we have a club, we use the library commons for that. Yeah. But the there is a dance studio that's not being used. And so we're hoping to kind of use that at some point for our club what? meetings and our classes and our performances. And rehearsals, I guess. Mm -hmm. And rehearsals, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. 
So, where does where does that bring us up to? I've been teaching at the college for this is my fourteenth year. At the end of this year, I'm quitting. So that's mm -hmm. and I'll be doing my podcast and my Ooh. writing. Okay, so I noticed that you've done some globe trotting. Oh, um, you're, talk you, you're talking about you, our trip around the world. My, yes. yes. Tell me about okay. that. Okay. Let, so let's explore how, how, I mean, traditionally, Americans don't normally get a passport and leave America. For an American to get a passport and then do a circumnavigation, now, did you sail? Did you sail around the world, or did no, you do flew. like a? Did you did we, you do like a Jules Verne? We flew. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, oh, so that's sort of a long story. Let's see if I can make that short. We were living in Portland at the time, and I had stopped. I was still teaching, I think, through the Portland Parks and Rec and Vancouver Parks and Rec, but I was not doing theater. I was not in plays anymore. And uh, my husband and I had started doing what's, I don't know if you know what Reiki is. It's a laying on of hands type yeah. healing technique. And we had gone to a retreat in Brighton Bush, Oregon, which is a hot springs area. And the, one of the women there was from Germany and she needed a place to stay after the retreat was over so she could fly to New Zealand. And so we said to her, uh, you can stay with us. We have a guest room. It's just a week. Well, she had traveled a lot. Europeans have and Australians have this great. Uh, we have a friend from Australia. He's one of the ones we visited while we were on our trip. Uh, they get a stipend about, for travel. What? Yeah. Goes walkabout. Right. That's what the Australians and, do. They go walkabout. We just travel. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, he got, he worked at a university and so he would get a yearly stipend for travel. And we knew this. And so, and, and it seemed like, um, Vivian also had that same uh, kind of situation in her work. She would get a stipend for travel, yearly travel. So she was regaling us with all these places that she'd been around the world. And at the time, my the older of my younger sisters and her family lived in Tokyo. We had our friend in Australia. Uh, we knew, had a contact uh, of a theater person uh, who lived, whose friend lived in Greece and was becoming a priest, uh, an Orthodox priest. We knew some, we had a contact in France. Uh, the only place we didn't really have a contact was in India, which I wish we'd had a contact there. Uh, so it, and we, there was going to be a tour of Glastonbury and, uh, those kinds of sacred sites in England. Well, that fell through, but we decided to go anyway. So we wanted to go to all these places. And uh, Vivian said, well, at that time in 1990, this is 1996 uh, or 1995 is when she was telling us this. She said, well, I think you can get around the world trip ticket for about $3,000 now, Barry and I didn't make a whole lot of money, but that seemed like, oh, wow, we might be able to manage mm. something like that, actually. And so we took her, it was my husband's birthday weekend, and we took her to the airport, and then we went off to the coast for his weekend, his birthday weekend. And I was sitting, I had been on the way to his birthday party, uh, I was sitting in the car waiting for Vivian because she was tr um, getting some money exchanged so in preparation for going to New Zealand. Mm. And I said, I wonder how we can afford to take this trip around the world. And I heard in my head, you could sell your house. 
And so <laughs> That's I went, a bit drastic. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, we had been Barry and I had been talking about moving away from Portland anyway because the gang mm. violence was getting quite bad at that time. And so we had wanted to move to a smaller town. We were thinking of moving to Roseburg. Oregon, which is in Southern Oregon. And we have college friends who got married the same day we did. And they lived in Roseburg and it would be fun to live near them, you know? So uh, anyway, I'm dri we're driving to the coast. And I said to Barry, I thought of a way that we could take our trip around the world. And he said, oh, I thought of a way too. I wonder if it's the same way. And I said, we could sell our house. And he goes, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> And so we knew right then that's what we were going to do. And it was right at the time when the housing market was in inflating. So we mm. had bought our, our 1949 house for $39,000 and we sold it for 90,000, I think, or something like that. Some ridiculous thing like that. Mm. So of course now it would probably be a whole worth a whole lot more than that. Yeah, because housing prices in the United States have gone really wacko. Um, and so we had enough money to take our trip around the world. And then right before we left, my father had his second heart bypass surgery and he almost died on the table. And they, they my parents had moved to Arizona. They had retired to Arizona and Barry's parents also lived in Arizona. And so uh, and my my sister, my youngest sister's first husband's parents lived in Tucson. So we all, the four of us flew down to be with my mom and dad. And we stayed at my um, in-laws house in Phoenix because my dad was in Phoenix. And um, we stayed there for a week. And that year in the Northwest, it was so cold and rainy. It was April and it was 85 and beautiful in Phoenix. And mm. we're like, oh, maybe we should <laughs> all move down here, which actually ended up happening for a while. My two younger sisters moved to Arizona too. And, um, and we lived, we lived on the opposite state side of the state of my mom and dad it was five and a half hours away from our house. But, mm. but, uh, you know, we could, we could drive over there and see them on a weekend if we wanted, if we had a three day weekend and, uh, but he was okay. He, he recovered. And so while we were on our trip, we decided to move to Arizona. And so we had enough money to do that without jobs mm -hmm. or, and it all worked out. So, so, so you actually sold the house, mm -hmm. had enough money to, to buy another house in Arizona mm -hmm. And enough money to do your trip. We didn't buy a house to begin with. We just rented a house to begin with. Mm. But once we got established and got our jobs, yeah, we bought a house. Uh, we the house that I'm we're living in now. We've lived in for twenty years this year. So, and it's a manufactured home. I mean, it got here on wheels, and it's not. You know, it wasn't that super. It's not a super expensive house, but it's adequate for us it has four bedrooms so barry and i each have an office and we have a guest room and and it sits we have four acres and we sit a mile from the border of mexico and we have these fabulous views all around us of mountains and uh, we have all kinds of wildlife that come through our property and it's very that's quiet no way to, that's no way to uh, talk about the mexicans <laughs> It's not the Mexicans that, well, I mean, I suppose they do come through our yard, but I'm talking about real wildlife. I'm talking about uh, bobcats and, bears and, and, <laughs> and it, I haven't seen any bears come through our property, but bobcats have come through and we have lots of birds and quail. We have large mm. family of quail, a couple of families of quail and the deer come and drink out of the trough and, Javelina, I don't know if you know what javelina are. They are, um, they look like pigs, but they're not pigs. Mm. Um, and they smell really awful. Um, 
So they come through and knock over the water trough a lot. I mean, they've broken a couple of birds feeders and <laughs> so oh dear. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we have all these fun animals that we get to see and hmm. um, occasionally some snakes, although not, I haven't seen a snake in quite a while. Or tarantulas. We see tarantulas sometimes. Yeah, Tom so it's West. fun. It's really You fun. wouldn't want to be an acrophobe then? No. <laughs> no, because during right before monsoon, I think it's right before monsoon, the tarantulas have their, like, migration. And, yeah, so that's when we see them on the road is during their migration. Yeah. yeah. So... So that kind of brings us a bit up to date now then. So what, yep. what are you currently working on? I have a novel that I've been working on for probably three or four years. Uh, I, t teaching gets in the way. And then, when, since I started mm. the podcast in 2020, that gets in the way. But it's getting close now to being finished. The first draft is close to being finished. Yeah, And... Uh, and I have a blog also that I do once a week. So, mm -hmm. and I have five more weeks of teaching and then I have the summer off. So. And are you going back after the summer or is that it? The pin's coming out and you're going to retire? Uh, no, I, my, my co-teacher, as I said, is a professional, a theater professional. So he has, he has a version of Twelfth Night that he directed in 2019 that somebody in Philadelphia, I don't know how they ended up in Sierra Vista, but they came and saw the show and they were involved in a professional theater company. And so his version of Twelfth Night was done in Philadelphia this December. Then he also works with a theater company in Alaska. So he's doing his version of Twelfth Night next December, this coming December. And uh, so I will be teaching the 16 week class while he teaches the eight week um, acting class and then runs off to Alaska. Yeah. And then I'm finished. I'm finished after that. So I finished up at Christmas then. Mm -hmm. And he'll take over my classes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then you'll concentrate on, on, on writing and, and podcasting mm -hmm. full time. Mm-hmm. Yes. It can it can get you like that. It can take on a momentum of its own. Yes. I found out. <laughs> oh yes, really, I'm sure you have. Do you uh, edit yeah. your podcast? Because yeah, I do I, it. I, I, I don't have anybody that can do it for me, so I do it all myself. I mm -hmm. I, I do the the audio in the Adobe Audition. So mm -hmm. uh, from this I can download the two separate tracks and then I, I edit the two separate tracks right. and then I do the, the video in Adobe Premiere Pro Ah, and I okay. do all my own graphics um, uh -huh. uh, in Photoshop. That's great. And, and then I'm working on my own book. <laughs> oh, cool. In, in, in InDesign. Oh, yes. My husband so, uses all of those programs. Yeah. Because he's a graphic so, yeah. artist. Um, I mean, he's really a visual artist, but his job to pay the bills is a graphic artist. Yeah. Yeah, graphic designer. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does it? Does he use Illustrator a lot then? And mm -hmm. uh, the drawing side of it, I, I couldn't. I, I still, I still struggle at getting my head into Illustrator for some reason. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm, I'm fine with with Photoshop. I'm fine with. Um, uh, with Premiere Pro and and say Adobe Audition, but when it when it comes to <laughs> Illustrate, it just goes over my head. I yeah. guess I'm not that that sort of um, um, creative. Well, I'm not sure mm -hmm. it's that. It's I don't know. My husband has he's kind of interesting. He uses both his left and his the right sides of his brain. And so yeah. he's really good at math. He's really good at all these, you know, technical, logical things, but he's also an artist. I mean, he sees, 
you know, he, he draws, he does pottery, he, yeah. you know, he does all this other stuff. So um, he's been using the Adobe suite and illustrator and all of those since I'm not sure when InDesign came along, uh, but he started in the 1980s when the Mac first started emphasizing yeah. the graphics stuff and the yeah. where he was working sent them to training and yeah what was i working on back then um on on the mac side of life we we were we were using obviously photoshop and and mm -hmm. um yeah indesign was about that time indesign's more for putting sort of um books and, and stuff together um, mm -hmm. but we use photoshop mainly for for putting posters and, and, and the like together. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was in psychological operations, yeah. I started off in the, in the print side of life. Um, oh. At that time, my my late wife, uh, she worked for a, a local printer. And oh. and I used to, to, to go in and help out occasionally. They had uh, a couple of presses in there, but I used to work on a, a Heidelberg single colour press. Uh, and I oh. used to mine that machine. Um, sort of overnight when they were having a big run of something um, just to help them out. Yes. So I understood the, the print processes. That's how I got into to psychological operations. And then I moved, when, when I, I was on the group, I moved to the um, the radio side of life. Um, so mm -hmm. I did an awful lot of um, recording and editing of, of, of radio products, radio shows and jingles and um propaganda material <laughs> <laughs> well my husband might say he does that too he works for the city of sierra vista in the marketing department and so anytime the city has a you know a, some sort of an event uh like this is a really great place for for ecotourism because we have birding mm. a lot of birding um sites a lot and of twitches turn up Yes, right. And the then twitches. also we had a we have bicycling events because you know bicyclists like to try their hand at bicycling in the mountains, which is where we are. Mm. We're in the mountains. So we're almost a mile high here where we live. So I, I prefer to have an engine on my motorcycle <laughs> or my bicycle. Yes, so right. I've, I've got a, I'm down to one motorbike at the moment. I, I've, I've just got my um, 1200 Ducati Multistrada, which is a touring Whoa. bike. Um, wow. I sold my race bike last year um, purely because I couldn't ride it any longer. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was a handful, <laughs> so I sold it. Oh, I've had hundreds great. of bikes over the years. My father loved motorcycling. He had a BMW at one point. Yeah. Mm. He loved, but my mother wouldn't ride with him. She was afraid. So when I was living with them right before I went off to college in Spokane, he would, he and I would get on the motorcycle and he'd take me to work in the morning. Mm. In Spokane. This is bef Spokane before uh, they moved to Bremerton. So yeah, yeah. I would ride with Happy him. Yeah, Wicked. So yeah. that brings us more or less up to date, doesn't it? So you're it looking does. at retiring at the end of the year and becoming a writer and a podcaster full time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Brilliant. I love the I podcasting. You. Yeah. I, I, I just love talking to people. Okay. Yes. I've, that... I've, I've got two of these, one of these, and that's that's how I try to use them when I'm, I'm chatting with people. Give them yes. the opportunity. Yeah, it, that is the most fun. And meeting people from all over the world, I love that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've had really interesting conversations with people. So you're the second one from the UK. I talked to someone, I was on her podcast and she was on mine from Scotland. Rosie oh. Beach. Mm -hmm. I've not seen her. Hmm. Yeah. I'll keep an eye out. It's Yorick... Radio Productions is the name of her podcast. Oh, I'll have a look she at it. Reads, she reads stories and she talks to people. Yeah, it's really fun. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway, how can people get hold of you? What's uh, what's your podcast? My podcast is Story Hyphen Power. It has to be Story Hyphen Power because there are other yeah. story powers out there. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's right now it's on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Or you can go to my website, my WordPress website, and it's Sage Woman Chronicles at sagewoman.life. That's where the show notes are. Mm-hmm. And the photograph of my guest. Then um, those I'll are the put all main this in, places in the, in the link. Okay, to the description. Cool. Yeah. So, Lucinda, thank you, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed our chat. I have too, Tim. I'm so glad you love theater. Oh, mad for it. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. The Tim Hill Podcasts, ordinary people's extraordinary stories.